Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Dutiful Future. Diving straight in today, I have a brand new and fantastic guest, the critically acclaimed author, Mark Blacklock. Mark, hello. Hello, Hugh. Hello. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> it's totally fine. So, Mark, you have two books published. You have I'm Jack from 2015 and a brand new one out now called uh, Hinton. Uh, and well, first of all, we're going to be talking about these books. We're going to be talking about um, the role of philosophy that's played in your writing, as well as some, you know, some tips and tricks for people who are trying to get into this sort of uh, into the literary world. Um, sure. So a quick introduction to I'm Jack. Um, first of all, you know, it's a book which, which, as I said earlier, critically acclaimed. You know, it's got 78 percent four and five star ratings on Amazon. The Guardian described it as an intelligent, disturbing slice of noir. Um, so, Jack, um, Mark, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be a, a bad one to confuse you. <laughs> well, uh, actually, no. I mean, it's you know, it's entirely appropriate because that's true, um, to be fair. well, you know, with please the, tell with, us about I'm Jack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the the um the reason that's appropriate is because I, I kind of uh, uh, appropriate the voice of John Humble, who who sort of assumed the himself assumed the identity of the Yorkshire Ripper and and did so. Um, by uh, copying letters um, written to the police when they were looking for Jack the Ripper, hence the um, hence the title "I'm Jack." So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's it's totally fine to <laughs> to kind of elide the identities because that's sort of the game of the book, as it were. So it's quite a, like a specific section of history that like not many people have have heard of. You know, the, the man pretending to be jack the ripper what what inspired you specifically to write about this 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 sort of this niche or this area of history yeah well i i grew up in sunderland um uh in the the 70s and 80s my family's from sunderland and i was sort of very loosely aware or because this all happened when i was like six and seven very loosely aware of this uh the fact that the guy who hoaxed the police when they were looking for the Yorkshire Ripper was from Sunderland. Um, and when I started writing fiction, um, and I was I was kind of interested in in ideas around identity and the appropriation of voice as as kind of literary acts, you know, what mm -hmm. what it means to occupy another identity and another voice in a in a literary context. And um this story then presented itself uh to me as a as a a way of looking at that and also you know i must confess to being <laughs> slightly obsessed with uh with true crime and, and, uh, and okay. <laughs> draws us to true crime like as much as anything i'm i, I was interested in why we why we have this sort of prurient interest in um in true crime and and this narrative sort of lent itself as a as a way of exploring that as well because because john humble the guy who hoaxed the police was himself obsessed with true crime stories and had kind of used everything he'd learned by reading about the investigation into jack the ripper in the 1880s to, to effectively do what he did uh in the 1980s so do you see um this book where you are i guess as you, as you put it appropriating um this voice as almost like an extension of the culture around true crime where you had a general interest for it. And then you saw this example and you thought, Oh, why don't I take this very common interest that we have in your know, rather like, you know, gruesome and horrific stories and take that to a different conclusion and take that to a different extent. That being someone actually trying to make themselves involved in these cases. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's right. I mean, I kind of, it, it's the way in which the, the the hoaxer is is parasitical on the true crime, and there's a kind of analog, you know, in that to to, to what we all do. I think what we you know what it, where that sort of cultural yearning to sort of um, involve ourselves in events uh, comes from. So yeah, I was at, I was wanting to look at at true crime to take a take, to shift that sort of perspective to think about. Th through telling the story how you know how we relate to these events what goes on and of course you know what happens when you start you know start thinking about it that way you become much more uh, in involved in in the effects on on the real people you know you can't you can't kind of engage with with true crimes without coming face to face with uh, the fact that they they've affected 
lives in 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 myriad ways. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was a journey of discovery to write as well. You know, it was it was interesting. Is that something that you think that is that has influenced your work or sort of improved your work in a sense when when you were doing the sort of research for this piece and uh, that being the sort of the increased focus on not only the direct story of you know who John Humble was and what his actions were, but the outside effects of you know who that impacted and how it actually really made a, a real well you know it sounds like just a, a silly hoax it actually made a real impact on people's lives is that something that, that you sort of grew a, a development of an understanding for an appreciation for whilst you were writing and uh, do you think that gave you a better understanding of sort of the period yeah absolutely so you know i i started from a quite kind of dry conceptual space i suppose thinking about what it would be just to occupy that voice to kind of hoax the hoaxer to get to kind of get use that that voice to tell the story mm -hmm. um and and it was absolutely it was through researching it that, that that i was thrown into into the contact with with various people so i mean and the first person was humble himself at a certain point you know i had kind of various dark nights of the soul where i thought is this an okay thing to do at that point in time, Humble had just been released from prison. He served four years of uh, an eight-year sentence. And, you know, while I felt it was uh, artistically legitimate to do what I was doing at, at a kind of ethical level, uh, I felt like he, he had to be offered the right to respond as, 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 you know, as you would if you were right, if you were kind of doing a journalistic piece about someone. So I wrote to him. I, I found his last known address and wrote to him and didn't receive a reply. And and I assume that's because he just, you know, he simply didn't want to talk about it. Um, I mean, I spoke to the, the uh, Daily Mirror's stringer in the Northeast, a guy called Jeremy Armstrong, who'd, who had actually sort of doorstepped the, the, the house and um, spoken to Humble's sister. And, and, and she said that he, he wasn't interested in talking, talking to the press. So, so I kind of that was one engagement, but then the like the much more sort of significant um, is with the the families of of the victims of the Yorkshire Ripper, um, and you know particularly those who because you know the very sort of theories about what happened. You know, I mean, Humble's intervention derailed the police investigation, and so they shifted their entire field of inquiry to Sunderland when they should have been looking in West Yorkshire as we know Peter Sutcliffe was um was you know based in Bradford and and sort of driving around Leeds and Huddersfield and Wakefield and and because the the John Humble had sent a tape he'd sent three letters to different papers and then a tape um sorry two letters to papers one to um uh one to George Oldfield and then he sent a tape to George Oldfield and the tape really hooked Oldfield, largely because of this sort of distorted intimacy that that, that Humble kind of had. He addressed it directly to Oldfield. He appeared to know certain things about about um, attacks that only the the killer could have known. You know, I, subsequently we now know that that he, he read all this stuff in newspapers, and it was simply that the, the police didn't have kind of rigorous enough filing systems to realise that. But um, yeah, yeah, sort of uh, the fact of Humble's hoax potentially cost people's lives because the police might have, have found um, found Sutcliffe sooner had he not intervened. So there was the, there's that sort of sense of responsibility when you're retelling this story, you're kind of reactivating this stuff. There, there's lots of people that that aren't going to want to to hear about this. Or indeed, will want their voices heard, um, you know, in, in an authentic way. Mm. You know, so so it's, it became a question, a set of questions that I had to ask myself. You know, how do you negotiate that? How do you deal with um, the the victims' voices? So, how much pressure did you feel to be as you know, accurate as possible and commit to pure realism? Whilst trying to balance that with making a you know a, a work of literature which is you know entertaining to read, um, how difficult was it trying to strike that sort of balance between entertainment and realism? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, so I, the the sort of formal way I work is uh, is sort of explicitly anti-realist, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, but 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 in a way that 
you know, uses and subverts different um, different realist, different sort of modes of narrative delivery, I suppose. I, I end up getting quite abstract when I talk about this stuff because, uh, you know, the realist novel essentially uses sets of uh, formal conventions you know, so but 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 and we buy into that those conventions as readers, but they aren't, you know, that they, they aren't real life. They are representative conventions. You know, the omniscient narrative voice is a, is a great example of this. I mean, there's no kind of equivalent to that in your head unless you're completely insane. So you know, these uh, uh, realism operates using sets of conventions that are really agreed between. Uh, writer and reader it's a sort of um, uh, a sort of contract and at uh, various times literature becomes interested in how to sort of more accurately address the the real how to how do you kind of deal with all that all that messy real stuff and put it into narrative form um, and the way that I've responded to that in my work is to is to work with documents which seem to me to be kind of residues of the real uh, that, that sort of have within them their own kind of codes of narrative, albeit you know much more abstract than than traditional uh, sort of storytelling. Um, and uh, I, so I used a lot of documents, both real and faked, um, in I'm Jack because Humble was a was a hoaxer and himself a a, a kind of writer of fiction. It's again, there was that it was the perfect sort of voice within which to nest these different documentary forms. So he sort of produces documents as as evidence um, to justify his actions and to explain what he's done. But, um, you know, also the 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 unreliable narrator is a sort of another convention of fiction that allows us to sort of address those those questions of reality, what happens when you get a, a character, which is a construct, um, dealing with the the apparently real. Um, and, you know, again, there are lots of different ways of doing that. Humble presents himself as, a, as the perfect, unreliable narrator. But of course, you know, to the reader, there's that other level that, you know, lurking behind Humble, a real person, uh, you know, is a writer who's, who's sort of ventriloquizing him. It's a really, you know, a fundamentally inauthentic way of doing story <laughs> so do you feel there was like a, a, a sort of a natural progression from what humble did because as you pointed out, he, he wasn't in some sense a storyteller he was telling a story uh around these murders to try and portray it as himself did you see that what he wrote would be did you feel it had like a natural transition into being a book because there was he was in a sense spinning a narrative and then what your job was to um uh, realize that narrative and then put the person behind it yeah yeah absolutely so he's yeah exactly that i mean it's quite early on i i, I began thinking of him as a a kind of distorted storyteller or even a satirist you know i mean what um again looking into his life he, it became apparent quite early on that he felt like he'd been mistreated he had a grudge against the police and and his actions were really about trying to get some kind of weird revenge on on the police and on authority in general and and he's a kind of curdled satirist you know he's trying to expose what's what's wrong mm -hmm. in the um the, the police and indeed in the, in sort of tabloid press coverage of this this set of horrific crimes and you know he he does that very effectively he he, he you know so I, I think quite a lot about satire as well and about like what's the what are effective ways of doing satire. Satire is an inherently conservative and moralistic mode. You know, here's something that's wrong with the world and I, I want to show it up. And it seems to me that actually the most effective equivalents to satire are sort of direct interventions um, or, or, or over identifications. I don't know, something like uh ad busters magazine or or different kind of um practices that have come to be called culture jamming where people sort of invent something real and put it in the world and uh other other people respond to it so it's a, a kind of 
yeah, intervening directly into the media, you know, so something like um, in Brass Eye where Chris Morris interviews celebrities and shows the workings of the media and how people sort of pimp themselves out to, to different causes, that's much more effective than a kind of narrative satire. And I sort of began to think of Humble as someone like that, albeit working to to sort of pretty twisted ends, he was he was operating in that same mode. He was sort of wanting to insert himself into the media machinery and uh, and to sort of break its normal functioning. So one could almost perceive him as some sort of twisted performance art, where the entire purpose does ha- it has a it has a message. It's not just him obsessing over something. It, there is some some form of if you know, if whether it be twisted or not of a of an aim to try and expose something much like you know um the cases you point out where you can almost you almost compare it to something like the onion where it, it exists to to mock by injecting itself into these cases right right i mean this is it you know the best the best satire is stuff that is totally ambiguous and when it's first encountered it's impossible to tell whether it's invented or the real thing and you know the the onion every now and then when it really hits its stride gets that just right and you sort of read and think that's so close to uh to to the 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 thing that it's parodying it's it's almost indistinguishable um so yeah absolutely that it kind of you know, a, a kind of um, a kind of twisted performance art. Exactly. He, he, you know, it. He, I. He was undoubtedly shocked by the extent to which his his intervention was effective, and that was to do with the fact that that, that it was taken so seriously by um, by the police and particularly by George Oldfield. But um, yeah, I, uh, that, that's that's right. I, I did think of it as this kind of, you know, yeah, intervention you know so kind of get, getting into into the real and so again you know it, it works if you're interested in how the real plays out and how to you know how, how we sort of experience the real and something like that is is, is is an interesting moment so one thing you were given um quite a lot of quite a credit for was um your grasp of sort of the nuances and the um i guess patterns of language um used by uh, used by john uh how how much research did it take to try and assume someone else's um <laughs> voice in a sense because you know i guess a lot of people have their, their struck their difficulty with writing is you know writer's block it's trying to put their words out there where your mission was not to write your words it was to write yeah. someone else's yeah, yeah 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 well i was very fortunate in this this particular instance because uh, a lot of attention had been paid to Humble's uh, voice, his, his the specifics of his dialect, you know, to the extent that there, it remains a kind of subject for um, academic study. The, the field of um, forensic dialect studies is interesting, you know, is specifically dedicated towards that, you know, how when you hear a recorded voice, how um how well can you pinpoint its its location in terms of dialect i mean we've been we've been kind of recording and studying dialect since the late 19th century and and there are some quite detailed studies and maps um uh, of of dialect around the british isles and the uh the sort of particular was um oh god french associates Philip French, I'm a, I'm a friend. I, I have forgotten over the past five years the, the specific uh, dialectologists who who worked on um, Humble's case, but they, um, you know, they, they did a, they did a really kind of good forensic job on it and 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 located his accent almost to within a mile of where he had grown up and where he was from. But they started off at the at the north of the weir in Sunderland and went inland through sort of different mining villages um and coming along the north river and they stopped when they got to the to the place where they thought the accent was from Castleford and just south uh, of the river was the Ford estate which was where Humble actually grew up so I mean they they, they pinpointed it almost you know precisely you know to, as I say to within about a mile um but the, yeah, then there was kind of more detailed analysis on uh, specific kind of vowel forms and uh, uh, and sounds around it. 
and then and then obviously the words that he used as well and because i grew up in sunderland i was familiar with a lot of the um a lot of the kind of local slang terms um and so it was quite it was uh, enjoyable to sort of occupy that voice you know to really sort of go back go back to to the sort of stuff that I'd heard when I was growing up and to sort of really get into the accent and to sort of think about the nuances you know the differences go back between, home in a sense <laughs> yeah exactly to go back home. think about the differences between like like Sunderland has a much gentler kind of there's a bit like air it sort of falls back into the airs like that I'm, I'm you, not gonna try I'm not gonna try <laughs> if, you, if you if you've gone up to Newcastle it's a bit more a, yeah. <laughs> stuff, you know it's a bit more okay. kind of, it's a challenge not to swear as soon as <laughs> you can have one you can have one if you need to have one <laughs> So yeah, so uh, you know, really interesting to sort of think about how how dialect changes as you make quite small shifts down the country. And there there are some um, you know professional actors who are really really good at this at these kind of switches between um, local dialects. But but the northeast obviously is sort of my area. And so yeah, that thinking about that difference between your castle and then Sunderland, which is a bit softer and falls back into the heads like that. And then when you get back further south down to sort of Vic and Bob sort of style um, from from Cleveland. Vic and Bob, kind of a bit more like this, you know. (laughs) So was this something that you you felt like you needed to do a lot of research into in order to make sure that it was was a convincing performance? How much focus did you have in the early days of writing this? Did you put into saying, right, I need to make sure that everything that I do is believable as this person? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I... I my practice is very research heavy. You know, I'm I'm I started my professional life as a journalist, and I have always kind of like started writing any story by by reading and speaking to people, and so I've kind of taken that practice into my um, into my fiction. I also um, I I now work as a, a as an academic and English literature lecturer and. Um, and research literary history and cultural history. Um, and that is very, so I kind of use those, all the, all the, all the kind of research techniques I've learned in, in, as a, as a journalist as an ac- and academic and take those to fiction. But as you, you know, observed earlier on, you know, fiction is, it is ultimately you have to carry a story. I mean, you have to, uh, you have to create plausible characters. You have to take a reader with you, and um, that uh, really that you know in sort of I don't know how to exactly how to explain this, but that that sort of the, the, they're the kind of predominant concerns of most literary fiction. Mm-hmm. I have to say I'm less interested in the notion of uh, a sort of artificial character than I am in. What, what kind of getting at the um, the sort of deeper concerns of what what it means to be uh, a sort of thinking consciousness, a sort of thinking <laughs> human, and and so character becomes a cipher to look at, at those kinds of things. So you know, I, I, yeah, I, I was concerned to make it plausible, but perhaps more for the purposes of um, then uh, that would allow me to look at uh, uh, what it is about character that we put into literature. So it was more of a, uh, rather than an endeavour in itself, it's a tool to get you towards the core of what you were trying to do, whether it be exploring the story or exploring the, the very concept of a narrative voice in, in within a character in a sense. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. I'm really interested in how and in, in how we achieve that kind of magic trick of 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 getting consciousness into the page, and and I'm most interested in in the kinds of literature that that do that in in sort of exciting ways. So, what would be your your one your one line to sell people on buying Iron Jack? Why why should people be <laughs> opening this book up, downloading it on their Kindles to to explore this world? Mm, okay uh well the the purest of uh, unreliable narrators uh in their own lies um you know it's 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 a journey into the idea of of the lie and the hoax and it 
uh, it, it will locate you within that mindset. Mm -hmm. That's more than one line. But... <laughs> that, that'll do. That's perfect. Um, transitioning onto your, your brand new uh, book now, Hinton, uh, if you, you, you know, you've listened to the first 25 minutes of this and you've, you, you know, you thought, oh, so this, this next book will be maybe, maybe, you know, going further back in time, more gritty, you know, crime stuff. No, <laughs> Hinton <laughs> is is a is a dramatic leap from um from I'm Jack in in almost every possible way, rather than a you know a gritty, uh, nuanced crime uh, crime noir historical piece. Uh, Hinton is as a much greater historical presence. You know, um, in it, it it has very important and central concepts of mathematical pure space, fourth fourth dimension. Uh, it is the fourth dimension. Things which, upon first glance, are <laughs> Uh, far more than I could possibly ever hope to grasp. Um, so I think the first natural question is obviously what what is Hinton? What is the what is the you know introduction to Hinton that people would need? And then also what inspired such a massive change in um, in content? Yeah. Okay. So well, it, essentially, Hinton is um, a, a historic novel. I mean, it's a novel about a particular family in a particular period in time um they're a, a, an english family uh and the the book is set essentially between 1880 and 1908 so it's that the the fantasy the of the victorian period and the early 20th century and subsequent to to various events the family have to leave england and um live in japan and then leave japan um, for the USA, and so it's a it's a kind of family. I, I don't want to say an epic because it's not it's not as it's not as big as that. It's a it's sure it's very novel epic. <laughs> that's dealing with the um, the life uh, of of one family, and that family is sort of a, a, across three generations, but it's sort of slightly expanded because at the center of the book is the conviction of Charles Howard Hinton for bigamy. So that this family kind of splits and bifurcates, and there's a second family. He has children with his um, with his bigamous wife. So it's similar to uh, it shares what what it shares with Iron Jack is that um, it's a found narrative. Basically, it's sort of it, it's a the story of someone's life. It's a historical book as well. I mean, the period is just different. A lot of I'm Jack is set in the 1970s and early 80s, and, um, and this is you know, just a hundred years earlier. Um, but I'm, I, I'm interested in some of the same formal concerns in terms of how we approach the real, how you deal with real lives in fiction and what roles documents play in that. Um, and indeed what it means to kind of read as a, as a researcher and as a, as a, uh, sort of an archival digger you know and both both books kind of play play with those ideas so similar to i'm jack uh, one thing that's been praised about hinton so far has been its accurate portrayal of uh, victorian domestic life and then outside of specifically the domestic life as well and uh, and uh, my question is um so you just you said from you know i'm jack the research was in some way natural to you know you're from the air you're from you know, a, very, a vaguely similar area you mm. had a grasp of the sort of dialects how was there a big difference or a, a, a sort of a learning curve that had to be done in the jump from researching something that's you know that's much closer to to your experiences over to something which is you know totally foreign it's it's far beyond in the past it's a totally different kind of case with, and with less clear and present evidence from the you know the the Iron Jack story what yeah. how, was this was this a big leap in terms of research and I guess storytelling yeah well there's a bit of a, a sort of cheat in there <laughs> in my academic life I have um taught uh victorian literature and ah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I and um i i wrote my uh my first academic book on the idea of the fourth dimension of space it's a sort of cultural history of of where this idea comes from and it was in the course of that research that i that i came across the the um the hinton family and their various theories so I, I was kind of already immersed in that world uh, research-wise um, and had done a lot of thinking about the idea of the fourth dimension and um, how it kind of what its metaphorical potential is and, and, and what, it, 
what it does um, in that in that period in the uh, in the fin de siècle and early twentieth century. And also, like the fin de siècle is, is this hugely exciting kind of productive time. You know, it's a bit of a truism amongst Victorianists that everything that we think of as as kind of quintessentially 20th century is actually from the Victorian fin de siècle. And, and, you know, so that I wanted to write about that period. It's really about kind of the emergence of the, of the modernist mindset. Mm-hmm. So um, you, you touched on it there, but how, how much of a, of a role has, has philosophy played on your writing career? And then specifically uh, upon Hinton, you know, you bring it up, you know, concepts of the fourth dimension, mathematical pure space, these sort of issues, how, yeah great has philosophy been um whilst it's obviously more present in hinton but also in iron jack in influencing and inspiring your writings yeah well i'm i you know as an english literature academic you end up reading quite a lot of philosophy as you know i, I should stress as a kind of untrained philosopher <laughs> um you know i i i come at it um sort of theory as a, as a, a broad subset of philosophy the kinds of philosophy that are that are looking at culture and literature particularly um are uh I, yeah i've read quite a lot of that i've taught um taught an ma program in cultural and critical theory so i i have i read a, a lot of spe- very specific little bits of <laughs> philosophy um and that has influenced my thought uh a great deal over the years and, and and in researching for my academic work i've had to then sort of track back and engage with um sort of more i i suppose um uh, more significant um philosophical thought such as immanuel kant i remember oh, when i first classic oh, honestly. i've got i've got um critique of pure reason right oh, here. very good very good yeah, yeah. <laughs> you'll be you'll be right there for a... so i mean the, the part of the reason the idea of the fourth dimension is 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 kind of particularly exciting and interesting in the fin de siècle. I mean, all the arguments about it are, are, are engaging with with Kant because you know Kant has space as an a priori condition of mind. Space and time are what exist before thought. Thought and mind happen within space and time. You can't think them into being. Um, but the fourth dimension of space or higher dimension space is sort of complicate that picture because they are essentially, you know, speculative spaces that sort of disprove or, 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 or certainly kind of create problems for that for that Kantian idea of space as something that is a sort of precondition of mind. Because I think one of the things that, that comes up quite a lot in Kant is his sort of perceptions, you know, it's the two world perception, the one world perception, which is to say that there's the world that we perceive and then there's the world in its reality. Yeah. Um, but, Luminal and the phenomenal. Oh, oh my! So many, so many words. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I understood yeah. it, the word a priori, and then I, then I, tra- I trailed <laughs> off. <laughs> so, specifically, I guess, I guess, uh, Kant and these sort of ideas. Is this something which is almost, you know, a lot of people they read Kant, and if it, it makes no sense, and then suddenly it clicks with them, and it changes their whole worldview. Do yeah. you see Hinton as almost a way for you to try and process the? complex and abstract ideas that you have experienced in your readings and research of various different philosophical concepts oh that's a good question so the hinton story yeah i mean almost exactly in terms of the you know the phenomenal and the noumenal but but really quite a kind of coarsened version of that you know what again how do you get the real into into a, a, a fictional structure and how do you you know how do you kind of create frames uh, or 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 sort of delivery mechanisms that might get you closer to uh to sort of <laughs> more philosophically ooh, real experiences it's a, it's it's a hard thing you know fiction quite often is is it's a combination of the of the sort of like the researched the exceedingly considered and then there's this sort of big dose of just intuition like what are you gonna do how do you do it just right and do it um and 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 so there's the, there's a bit of that you know if it's overstudied and overworked it can 
it can be, I think, quite alienating to read. And I, I, I hope to avoid that, but at the same time to to do some of that sort of, yeah, to do some of that big philosophical work. Look, n- novels of ideas are not very um, not very hip at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> so like even, for example, you know, with my, you know, my small writing scale, which is mostly like student writing, student articles and stuff. Um, my number one piece of advice to anyone is always don't make what you're doing a Wikipedia article. Because yeah. like with the over research problem, they just they just throw facts at you and then it becomes unaccessible or you know boring. Do you see that this sort of this sort of these this, these philosophical ideas that you that you try and implement to your work as a sort of counterbalance from your you know intensive your um, research intensive style where you have so much detail in your writing, but that is balanced by grander themes which can be explored. So it doesn't end up just being something like a Wikipedia article where it is hit you know a list of facts about the period yeah um i kind of don't i don't think of it explicitly like that i mean i wonder if it i don't know it might it might work like that possibly so the better analogy for this might be so when i when i first proposed this novel to to my editor at the time he said, "I want you know, you, I want you to make this book something that kind of that turns you inside out, and that is because one of the features, one of the speculated features of a four-dimensional space is that if you m- are able to transport a three-dimensional object into a four-dimensional space, you can invert it. Mm-hmm. So the the simplest way of demonstrating that is by analogy. If you have um, a left-handed triangle that is on a plane a two-dimensional space as a three-dimensional being with access to three dimensions of space you can lean down into this two-dimensional space pick that triangle up flip it over and put it back down so you can invert the triangle because you are uh, able to act on it from a higher dimensional spatial manifold and so it is from four dimensions to three so a four-dimensional being can reach into the third dimension, take something out, flip it inside out, and put it back. And so you have this really kind of crazy uh, uh, feature uh, of, of four-dimensional space that also gives you some kind of like a metaphor that, that we use to describe uh, perhaps something intensely emotionally affecting. It turned me inside out. And I started thinking about all the different features of, of higher dimensional space in that sense. You know, what could I do with them as metaphors and structuring ideas um, and and sort of playing around with them at that level of, of the text? So, I mean, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a dreadful... Uh, sort of formalist i'm really interested in what you can do with the Mm -hmm. these mechanisms how you can kind of twist them and make them produce different effects um in literature so so it's really that's what it's doing the philosophical stuff is there to kind of i suppose to allow the reader reveries you know to sort of follow the characters into reveries of philosophical thought away from the kind of grounded realities of moving one character from one place to another or, or having them you know, experience a, an argument or a, or, or a fight, you know, the kinds of stuff that typically moves a dramatic narrative along, but also to, to provide this sort of set of structuring conceits that would allow you to experience as you pass through the book, a shift to different, perspectives and uh almost sort of different different worlds within the one novel so d- did you find difficulty in adapting and implementing such you know a, a, a complex abstract concept such as you know fourth dimension into a you know fiction literary book was this something that you you had a concern over whilst writing that you know maybe these two concepts might be might struggle to marry or something that you always thought you know what no this is this is this needs to happen, and this is something that will definitely take. <laughs> well, I always get because I'm quite because I'm familiar with the idea and, and and its potential, and also it's something that's done a lot of work in science fiction over the years. You know, mm-hmm. the um, the fourth dimension sits behind all all hyperdrives and <laughs> hyperspace, and you know it was a, a favorite 
kind of trick for H.G. Wells in his early fiction to to do things with the fourth dimension. It's sort of there was a model for how to do a lot of this stuff, and I, I, I am aware that I you know that I can tend towards particularly if you're sort of interested in conceits and in and, and in sort of formal constrictions, you know, you have to bear in mind at all times the fact that you can't overdo it. You don't want to, you know, you don't want to alienate people. Um and and I'm not sure I always get that balance right. Um by by do do try and do it. So um yeah, I mean the other thing that hopefully the you know the the, the blurbs and, and reviews will say is that, that there is a good story behind it you know there's a really good story and there again um i've tried to kind of give these real people lives that are interesting i mean the lives i've i've found you know they are interesting and i i you know i, I sort of dug those out of archive and i kind of didn't need to invent much to make them interesting but i've tried to to sort of give them um some some enough psychological uh again i'm sort of wary of words like re realism or depth mm -hmm. because i mean that's the idea of psychological depth right i mean that is in and of itself a, a dimensional yeah. a spatial construct you know flat characters are from dimensional fictions from edwin Appard's flatland they're the original flat characters <laughs> so you know i am interested in this kind of stuff and playing with that is 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 fun and interesting to me and i hope it doesn't get in the way of, of other people enjoying it as well one thing um so the, the the film director robert eggers um who often i think um uh, from what i what you know from what you've been saying has a, a sort of similar vision to you which is taking abstract concepts and implementing them into his artwork and i think what he always said was um when you watch when you watch a film or you read a book and it it has you know abstract complex um concepts that you know the reader or watcher might not be able to understand or they, they've never heard of before as long as there is that sort of story or a narrative which can engage then anyone can understand these concepts or anyone can get on board with things which seem to be you know when you try and describe them out of context from a literary novel seem to be you know ridiculous and uh, the, the, the potentially wouldn't be the most you know captivating for them but when yeah. there is a story such as you describe you know with with this family that it becomes it becomes real you know not to use the word real but it becomes something which is um graspable yeah makes sense i mean you've got to dramatize things really to make them kind of come off the page and you can dramatize in lots of different ways i mean i think you can dramatize in in quite um you know at abstract ways you can have sort of flights of the imagination that are, that are themselves quite dramatic because of when they take place but but yes i think i think that's right you know essentially the characters and uh, the, the the narrative arcs become ciphers and delivery mechanisms and, and i like you know thinking like that and the, the better you can disguise your ciphers as real plausible people the more you're going to get away with yeah. So in the case of um, the relationships in philosophy and literature, uh, your Twitter bio, you have a quote from uh, Michael Serres, that being, only philosophy can go deep enough to show that literature goes still deeper than philosophy. Um, <laughs> what does this quote mean? <laughs> ah, well, <laughs> to put it so blatantly, and, and what do you describe as the relationship between philosophy and literature, whether it is throughout history or in your own work? Oh, that, I mean, again, that's a really good question. So, so Sal is very interested in uh, what he calls a structuralism of contents. He he sort of looks for analogies between models across disciplines. He's totally disinterested in the the kind of silos that we build around um, ar around sort of academic practices. Uh, in the contemporary university and and he likes to be able to move freely between for example um you know classical science physics thermodynamics um and literature mm. as well as, as as philosophy so um there's there's a kind of uh you know continental philosophy i think is often quite the you know if you read Sarah or you read Derrida or you know, these guys always go to literature for models quite often they will have written critically about literary fiction there's a the kind of very rich culture particularly in France of engaging 
uh, and and German philosophy as well of engaging with with kind of literary criticism as a way of furthering the ideas of philosophy and using literature as a model for demonstrating philosophical ideas. And I think uh, Sayre is an expert at that because his predominant method is to is to look for those structural analogies between different sort of different forms. Um, so that's that, that that's why what, what I get from that. Um, and yeah, yeah, it's interesting to me that you know the way that that different different philosophers kind of treat literature as a sort of stock of uh, of, of examples. And I do there's something about the kind of texture of the literary experience that enables you to do some of that work uh, in a in a slightly more nuanced way. In that you kind of take you know you're it's perhaps a more intimate engagement with a reader than the the sort of more um, strictly kind of rational or. Uh, God, I want to I want to use the Kantian word apodictic without really having a tight handle on what it means. <laughs> I think this is what I'm fine. Saying. I'll uh, I'll slap up the definition on screen right now so everyone can. Uh, it should be over my face. So everyone can see um, whether or not it's correct. Yeah, you can yeah, do this. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, sort of like really kind of tight reasoning that produces um, uh, sort of self-evident answers. Um, you know, the, the, obviously, there are many as many different styles of philosophy as there are of um, of, of literature. But um, yeah, the, the experience of reading literature allows perhaps for that um, for the for the sort of philosophical concepts to be more um, sort of to take more intimately experienced. So, um, I think one thing that often gets ignored in sort of studying of philosophy or um, or literature uh, is that the sort of closer I guess, reciprocal relationship between the two. I mean, you know, there's plenty of philosophical works that come to mind, at least for me, which are um, which are written in styles of, you know, fictional conversation. You know, the classic mm. Socrates and Plato, Leibniz comes to mind. Yeah. Um, and I guess my the natural question would be, do you often see that what literature can be is a, a tool to present philosophy in a more digestible way? Um, I don't kind of... That isn't how I set out, but it may be mm -hmm. part Maybe of... A, 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 um, I guess uh, a result. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the examples you give the, the the kind of dialogue mode. I'm immediately sort of thinking about um, Edwin Abbott's Flatland, purely because we're think talking about higher dimensional mm -hmm. uh, fictions, and it's a, an important book for me. And in Flatland, there are uh, sections of dialogue between a square and the sphere about uh about the experience of of raised dimensionality that, that are definitely kind of calling back to um to plato so yeah but i'm sorry i've forgotten the, your question here <laughs> it's totally fine um is that the, the basic question was around you know for example philosophy is something which i think is a lot more present in people's in people's lives especially in you know in things like literature um lit, uh, things like writing and, and film that people realize you know film, yeah. even films like the matrix you know they're extremely philosophical in their in their concepts um and i think that in exploring the sort of relationship between literary works and philosophy um do you see these two concepts as being far more wedded and yeah. um closely matched and matched in a, in a good way than people often would yeah that's that that's absolutely right yeah i mean they, they, again when you when i'm te you're teaching um kind of cultural theory or critical theory you often will use as source materials you know ultimately you're looking at reading and un better understanding um cultural objects whether they're films or books or artworks um and that is because these these cultural objects can embody philosophy can kind of do that thinking uh, in in a, in a sort of cultural um, form, uh, I'm thinking at the moment of there's a really great radio program recently by Matthew Sweet um, on existentialism and film. You know, looking a lot at Woody Allen, but also at Bridget Jones's diary. You know, the sort of idea of the existential experience um, of uh, you know, that that sort of trying to find free will within a uh, a, a sense of a futile world. <laughs> 
something that that is really beautifully done in Woody Allen films, for example. So you know, you've got a yeah. There's 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 a, a lot of different cultural objects do different types of philosophy in different ways. You know, in contemporary art, there's loads of people doing work that is directly responsive to, say, for example, um, Timothy Morton's philosophy, or, or or Bruno Latour, or you know, sort of contemporary art and contemporary philosophy are very very sort of closely in conversation. Um, I can't I can't see. Bjork videos without thinking of Donna Haraway and her writing about cyborgs and kith and kin and relations between um, humans and animals. So yeah, there's a there's a lot a lot out there. So as we did with I'm Jack, what would be the the one or two lines and the you know the selling point or what you would say to someone if they ask why should I be reading Hinton? It's uh, one of my friends calls it a bodice ripper. I hope that it's <laughs> it's got a bit of that. It's got some sort of classic. It's a way of enjoying uh, some mind bending fantasy eclair philosophy within the shell of a traditionally rollicking historical <laughs> family novel. Mm-hmm. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic summary there. Um, one final last question. Uh, what advice do you have for budding authors and people who they are starting to explore these sort of worlds of, you know, trying to write a book? It's something which people find extremely daunting. And having been published twice, what have been the main lessons and challenges you faced in, in this journey? Yeah, well, the first thing is to just write, write, write. I mean, there's no shortcutting that bit. You just have to write and the more words you get under your belt the better your writing will become um and you know i don't think that there's anyone who stops learning to be a better writer you know as careers go on people i think actually get better at doing what they're doing you know regardless of 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 how books are received at different stages of careers um but you know when starting out i think it's all the more important you know just 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 to sort of be in the game to write to produce to be doing it primarily for yourself to begin with and then to start sort of um testing stuff out in different contexts um i mean there's loads the great thing about the current moment is that you can publish instantly and for free um online and that's meant that there's a proliferation of of outlets um, all kinds of different different levels um, w- producing really really fascinating work you know and and then there is you know there's just kind of lots of levels within it but the main thing is to get stuff out there and you know even if you put it on your own blog that's a that's a great start that's that's where I started writing was just well, in fact I, before publishing stuff to a blog I was part of a writing collective and we self-published to paperback collections of mm. short stories and um, and performed a, a couple of little literary festivals and that was that was a really great way of of cutting cutting our teeth. So I think getting involved in literary culture is is a is a really good place to start. Right then, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. It's uh, a pleasure. This has been great. So I have a few things to shout out. Number one, everyone follow Mark on Twitter. Uh, it's at Doctor Blacklock. Check it out for more updates on on Hinton and I'm Jack. I'm sure um, the both the uh, the links to buy uh, I'm Jack and Hinton will be in the description of this video. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed listening. Mark, once again, thank you for coming on. Thanks very much for having me here. It's been lovely to chat. No problem at all. Thanks very much, everyone.